so today I just want to talk about the lesson portion of it, the curriculum of it, um, that in a, a lot of the different guests that we've talked to uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, like we had Marsha Hines on yesterday, and we were talking about how she learned how to be a therapist when she was in college, but that she didn't know which lessons, so that when it came time and her son was diagnosed with autism, she didn't have the curriculum. If somebody had given her the curriculum and said, here's what your child needs to learn, she knew how to do it, but she didn't know what to teach. And, and I think having a curriculum in front of you for all the teachers that are out there and for all the parents um, that are out there who go, I don't know what to teach my child, this is an answer. Um, because everything that you could potentially want to teach your child is here. If you want to know how to teach it, there are... Um, there are teacher notes that are in there that are very useful, but if you want to know how to do the, uh, the, the different principles of ABA, then I encourage you to go to the Institute for Behavioral Training and you can learn all of that there. And between those two tools, what I know is that anybody who's out there who says, I want to be able to help a child, I want to be able to help an individual who's on the spectrum, between those two tools, I know you've got a way to do it. That's exciting to me. So that's one of the reasons why we talk about it so much and the fact that it's just so completely awesome. So keep in mind, I'm not talking about, you know, all the other th parts of it today, just the lesson portion of it, the curriculum. So you see here, we've got the eight different curricula areas, and I'm going to go through them really fast because we've only got like three minutes here. But uh, across the bottom here, social, ah, wonderful, right? Motor, language, adaptive, play, executive functions, cognition, and academic. Now, uh, it's important to remember that skills was designed to include every single thing that an in individual would, if they were completely neurotypical, and I don't know that anybody is anymore, but if they were neurotypical on a standard, um, that they would begin to learn before their ninth birthday happened. Um, but that's what you're beginning to learn. So when we talk about a skill that's emerging, for instance, one of the lessons that's in the language curriculum is how to join a conversation when a group of people are talking, how to come into the conversation, how to lean your body in, how to pitch your voice a certain way, how to listen for a few minutes so that you know what the topic is about, how to make eye contact with one or two people so that you can begin to speak in the conversation. This is some pretty intense stuff. I know adults that have issues with this that could use this lesson to strengthen their ability to join a conversation at a party, right? So we're not suggesting that a neurotypical nine-year-old knows how to do this and knows how to do this brilliantly, right? That would be crazy to assume that. But for um, for an eight-year-old to begin to notice, oh, there is a way to join a conversation and to maybe have one portion of that that they're beginning to work on that they don't really have down pat yet, we call that an emerging skill. So don't fool yourself into thinking, well, I've got a 15-year-old. What does this have to do with me? Believe me, um, there are several portions of the curriculum that you could work on with anyone, neurotypical or otherwise, at any age, and that they would gain skills. In particular, I would say that that's true of the social curriculum, the executive functions curriculum, and the cognition curriculum. That those areas, I don't think any of us ever get to the point where we could say, I have no need of that, right? So especially for our high functioning kids and for our teenagers and adults, those three areas I think are beneficial across the board. Um, but for our kids who are younger, I think that they're, it's amazing what's in the other curriculum. And for some of our kids that are maybe 14, 15, and 16, there might be other lessons in other curricular areas that we see, wow, I could really use that right now. Wished I'd had that when he was seven, but I can still use it right now. Now. Okay, so I'm going to dive in here and very briefly uh, talk for a second about each one of these things in the under three minute thing. I'm not going to get very far. I'm probably only going to talk about social skills. Um, but I want to give you an idea. If we, if we go to the slide here where it shows all the different areas in social skills. So we've got non-vocal social behavior, social language, 
huge curriculum in social language. Social interaction, self-esteem, social context, social rules, group-related events, and absurdities. Now, we don't necessarily need to do them in any specific order, and there is an assessment that you can take, um, that we encourage you to take if you're gonna use skills, that you start at the beginning and you answer a series of questions about, can this individual do X, Y, and Z? Um, and next week, I'm gonna see if I can get to the point where I talk about the best way to take the assessment so that it's not a miserable activity in your life. But as you check things off and say, no, we don't have this, or no, I'm not sure that we have this, it makes lessons available to you on those specific areas. So I'm going to move, for instance, into the non-social behavior arena. And within that arena, there's a whole host of lessons that are there that have to do with four different things. And you can see that I could work on this with a three-year-old, and I could work on this with a 14-year-old, and I could work on this with a 37-year-old. Eye contact. And it doesn't matter how old you are, uh, being able to make eye contact when it's necessary uh, and when it would be useful to somebody is something that's really good. That doesn't mean that we're making that staring crazy eye contact, but it gives you all the lessons to be able to teach anyone how to do eye contact and how to reinforce them for that so that they will do it more. Uh, Non-vocal imitation. Being able to imitate what somebody is doing is one of the bases of all teaching. So, and I made this gesture because that was the first thing that my son did. He mimicked me doing, uh, giving a credit card swipe. So that's why. Why I did that. But you know what? It was the beginning for me of seeing, oh, I can teach him how to do things. And if you can get imitation down, woohoo, all kinds of things can happen. Body language and facial expressions. How many people do we know on or off the spectrum that miss a cue at some point of somebody who's done with the conversation? They're ready to go. Their body is in a certain way. Their body language is su suggesting that it's in a certain way, but somebody misses it. So this, this this you can start with kids that are really young and teach them, oh, look at mom's face. Look at what she's doing. Is mom happy or unhappy? And what can we do about this? So that they begin to get that social awareness of cues that are happening. And then gestures, gestures to regulate social interaction. Um, so for a lot of our kids' gestures, this is something that my son is still working on. Um, but being able to understand when somebody says, mm-mm, you know, or mm-hmm, or, you know, do this or whatever. I, I, my, the, the big exaggeration is whenever you watch something that shows Navy SEALs and people like that, and they have all the hand gestures and they're like this, you know, uh, and, and I just want to know what all those things are. Uh, but it's important for our kids to be able to understand what, you know, what it means when you do this, uh, what it means when you do this, right? Uh, because they will be in a classroom at some point where somebody will be engaging in these gestures. And sometimes they're gestures that I've never seen before. Uh, this is honestly a, a portion of the program that I could use as well. So you begin to get an idea. We're not going to get any further than that, but you begin to get an idea of how this all breaks down. And each one of those curricular areas that we were talking about before, um, you know, we just focused in on one area. We focused in on the social skills, and then we further focused in on the non-vocal social behavior. And then we see that there's a whole host of lessons in four different categories within within that, within that, within that. So so you begin to see what is here. It's over 6,000 different things that you can work on in different ways. It's absolutely amazing. I want to encourage you to try skills out. You have the ability to do a 14-day free trial. You do have to give your credit card, and then on the 15th day, they will charge you. But I really want to encourage you, if there's anything that you remember from this, if you're going to do the free trial, make sure when you log in, you're going to be asked a set of 10 or 11 questions to begin with. And the first question you're going to be asked is, what is the child's birth date? Make sure that you don't put in something that's inaccurate there because it will only give you lessons that are skill appropriate to that age. So don't fudge that. You can put a different name for the child, but don't fudge the birth date. It's really super duper important. 